All right, now the part of, the, of this chapter, there's a lot of great things in this chapter. If you notice, there was the, um, the reference to, to spanking children earlier in there. We didn't get to that this morning, but that was another place that, that has that. But um, this morning, or this evening, what I'm going to be preaching on is the last part of this chapter is talking about alcohol. Okay, it's talking about drinking wine. And um, those of us that, that have partaken in this, you know a lot of these things that it's say you know, all of it is true, but unfortunately, some of us just know this by experience. Um, you know the effects that it's going to have on you, but but whether you have the experience or not, the Bible is the truth, and this is this is not a lie. And, and there's a certain aspect about drink. There's a lot of different things we could preach on about drinking alcohol. Okay, there's a lot of different points I can make, and I was kind of struggling to to keep some things out. Because the Bible has a lot, a lot to say about this subject. And, but there's one thing that, that is a, a common theme in the Bible that it's a, a direct warning about consuming alcohol. And this is something that is not um, taught or shown by the world at all. I mean, we live in a culture in a day where drinking alcohol is acceptable. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, of course, you know, marijuana is illegal yet drinking alcohol is legal it's you know like again i'm not for marijuana but it's just kind of funny that that you see all the effects that alcohol has in people's lives and the fights and the you know the the alcoholism and the and the just the brutal damage that it does to your body the poison that that it that you know you take in when you drink alcohol and the effects that it has you know it we live in a culture where you know taking marijuana which in my opinion, doesn't have nearly the same devastating effects that alcohol has. That is illegal versus the other one. Now, again, I'm not endorsing marijuana by any means. The Bible teaches us over and over again that we are to be sober. It doesn't mention marijuana by name, but it says, hey, look, you need to be sober. Now, that commandment to be sober is very important to understand that because a lot of people will say, well, the Bible just teaches you not to get drunk, but it doesn't mean that you can't drink anything. Well, look down in this chapter where we were, Look at verse number 31 of chapter 23. This is an admonition. It says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He's saying don't even look at it. Okay, he's not just talking about the effects they have and that, which are in here. But he's saying, look, don't even look at it. And this is a certain kind of wine. This is important to understand as well. I'm going to get to this probably a little bit more later in the sermon. But when the Bible uses that word wine, it's not always talking about alcohol. It's important to understand the distinction. See, this Bible was translated into English in 1611. Okay, 400 years ago. The, the usage of the word wine was not solely for the alcoholic beverage as we know it today. When you go to the grocery store, if you're looking for wine, you know, everybody understands that to be an alcoholic beverage, right? But back in these days, it was not always referred to as an alcoholic beverage. Anything that came from fruit, like fruit juice, the word juice is only used in the Bible one time. To re and it's, in, it's used in a verse where it already uses the word wine. And so for, for basically to not be too repetitive saying wine and wine, it said wine and then juice. But um, it wasn't as common to refer to as juices. It's referred to as wine. And, and I'll prove that to you later. There's scriptures that will prove that there are beverages that the Bible refers to as wine that are not fermented. They do not contain alcohol. They are literally directly the juice from the fruit that is being that is that is um, it's referring to, um, and we see many references to wine in the Bible that are positive references, and then like this one, we have many references that are extremely negative. Obviously, you know it's not going to be some great, wonderful thing and some horrible thing at the same time. It's talking about two different beverages, but they're both being referred to as wine because they're both coming from um, the, the fruit and they're being juiced. And one is just happens to be fermented with alcohol and the other one doesn't. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 1, the Bible says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The purpose of the sermon tonight is to give you some wisdom so that 
You are not going to be someone who's deceived by alcohol, someone who's deceived by wine and strong drink. Because I'll tell you what, the devil's out there today deceiving people. You can see it just by when you drive down the road and you look at the billboards, look at the, look at, I don't, I mean, you shouldn't be looking at it, but, but when you see it, we've all seen them. You see the alcohol advertisements, whether it be on TV, whether it be in a magazine, whether it be up on a billboard, right? The alcohol advertisement, does that always give you the best understanding of what's going to happen when you drink alcohol? I mean, I see, you, you see these, these advertisements of people playing sports, like, like they're out on the beach and they're playing volleyball. So I was like, what does drinking beer have to do with, with that? You know, they're two completely different things. I'm not saying nobody has ever had a beer and played volleyball before, but what they're doing is they're taking an image that's fun, that's exciting. And you know, of course, everybody's clean cut. Everybody's, you know, everything's clean. And when you look at people on, on the television and they're going out and having a drink, you know, their house is in perfect shape and perfect order. You know, nothing's out of place. Everything is exactly right. And they're just sipping their drink and everything goes fine. Well, I'll tell you what, my friends, that is not reality. That is not the reality that's gonna come from drinking. Alcohol is dirty. Alcohol is, is, is something that you don't want to get messed up with. You don't want to be deceived by it. Um, let's, get in, let's get into this chapter a little bit. Chapter, look at verse number 29 of chapter 23. Because this gives a, very, a much more accurate depiction of what happens when we drink alcohol. Look at verse number 25. It says, Who hath woe? Woe is sadness. Woe is sorrow. That's why it repeats it. It says, Who hath sorrow? Alcohol is a depressant. That is a fact. There's no denying it. It's a scientific fact. Alcohol is a depressant, and alcohol will depress you, not just physically, but emotionally as well. Alcohol, it has a lot of effects on people, but one of the things that it's going to do, it's going to bring you woe and sorrow. Now, even if it's not just from the physical effects of drinking it, the end of drinking alcohol is going to bring you woe. It's going to bring you sorrow. It's not something that you need to have in your life. It's going to, it's going to do damage to you. Um, the Bible says, who hath contentions? Contentions are fightings, right? This is real common. That's why there's so many bar fights. Because people get into these fights. They start losing their judgment skills. They start mis you know, construing what people are saying to them. They fly off the handle. Many people drink alcohol. They get violent. They want to go out and start fights, right? Now, it, in their, in their right mind, when you're not drinking, people aren't just walking around. T normal people aren't going around just looking for fights. But some people, even though they wouldn't normally do that, when they start drinking alcohol, hey, that's what they're going to do. They're going to start picking fights. And <laughs> I don't have to explain that that's not righteous. That's obviously wrong to go out and just start fights with people for no reason. That's something that, that should go without saying. Um, that's not going to cause you joy in your life. It's not going to bring you any happiness going out and starting fights with people. Um, it says here, who hath babbling, right? Babbling is just, just speaking off, just, a, just nonsense, things that don't mean anything, right? Again, another, another effect of, out of drinking alcohol. You get a lot of people just saying a lot of stupid things. <laughs> just babble, 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 and it's running in their mouth. Who hath wounds without cause? And I can attest to this. Okay, look, this was a big problem in my life personally, and I'm not afraid to admit that. I'm ashamed of it, but I'm not afraid to admit it, that this was a big sin in my life. And I can attest to every single one of these things by experience. I shouldn't have to. I mean, the Bible is the word of God. It's the truth. I know that all these things happen, having wounds without cause. I remember waking up one day, I had a big old gash on my leg. No idea where that came from. I've got a scar to this day, just... just Got cut, I bled, I was passed out, don't know, don't know what would happen at some point during the night. Wounds without cause. Don't know where it came from, I woke up with it. Redness of eyes, of course, you know when people are under the influence of alcohol, your eyes start to, to die, your pupils dilate, your eyes become red. It says, they that, and again, this, then it answers the question, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, so at the end result of this, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. An adder is a snake. It's saying, look, you may think you're having a good time. You may think you're having fun with this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite you. It's going to sting. 
It's not going to be good. No one ever wants to get a bite from, from a snake bite, right? Obviously, it's, it's, it's poison. And it's refer, you know, alcohol itself, when you ingest alcohol, alcohol is a poison for your body. It is not good in any way. It's not, it's not something, you know, you hear the doctor saying, oh, you should drink a glass of wine. You know, I don't know if they still suggest that or not. But those benefits that you receive from that, it's not the wine. It's not the alcoholic wine that gives you those benefits. It's actually the juice that you would get. Like if you drank, oh, yeah, you could also drink grape juice. They won't tell you that. They just say, oh, yeah, drink some wine. And when, when the only good positive effects you would be getting from that would be coming from the juice itself, not from the alcohol. Um, it's, gonna, it, it's, it's like a serpent. It's going to sting. It's poison. It's not something you want to be putting in your body. And look, this isn't, this isn't a fun message to preach at all. It, but it's, it's a sermon of warning because there's so much out there saying the contrary that no, this is good. No, everything's fine. It needs to be taught. We need to understand this. As I said in a previous sermon, you know, covetousness is going to destroy your life. It'll ruin your life when you have that type of an attitude. Hey, alcohol, if you allow to just keep drinking alcohol, alcohol will destroy your life as well. This is another sin you don't want to play around with. You don't even want to mess with it all. You don't want to be that social drinker because every alcoholic, everybody who becomes a drunk starts off that way. You start off just having your first drink. You start off, you know, trying it once. You start off doing it that way, and then it escalates from there. Don't even put your foot in the door. I mentioned earlier, you know, the Bible exhorts us and it, and it commands us to be sober. After you have your first drink, guess what? You may not be drunk, but you are not 100% sober. You are not completely sober. You have that first drink. Alcohol starts having an impact on you. Your reasoning and judgment skills go down. And this is, this is a proven fact. You can't argue this. This is a scientific fact of all the study. People do all kinds of studies of even just drinking a little amount. Your judgment and your reasoning skills start to go down a little bit. And, and it starts to de decrease from there. You are not completely sober as soon as you take your first drink of alcohol. And the Bible commands us that we need to be sober. It's not just about not getting drunk. It's being sober that we need to do. Look at verse number 33 because this is going to get, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really going to dig into a, a, a subject on alcohol. The, the title of my service is The Perversion in Alcohol. Look at verse number 33. The Bible says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. The Bible saying these things are going to happen. When you, when you start drinking alcohol, will you tarry long at the wine? Hey, men, your eyes are going to be starting to look at other women. Strange means like they're strange to you, right? I mean, normally a man will have a wife. That is not a strange woman. That is, your, that is a woman that you know. That is a woman that is, that, that, is, that is yours. A strange is like a stranger, someone that's not your wife, yet your eyes are going to start beholding them. And you get this alcohol in your body, and it's going to start clouding your judgment. It's going to start giving you wicked thoughts. You're going to start looking at people the way you ought not to look at them. Where if you're sober, you're not going to think that way. You're not going to necessarily go down that road. But when you start getting that alcohol in you, you start getting that spirit in you. You know, you ever wonder why it's called like wine and spirits at the, at the liquor store down the street? Where you say, well, it says spirits up there. Yeah, you're getting another spirit. And it's not of God. It's a spirit that you don't want to have. It's a spirit of wickedness. And it's a, a spirit of perverseness. The Bible says, Thine heart shall utter perverse things. I mean, what's perverse? It's crooked. It's twisted. It's perverted. You do not want your heart uttering perverse things, being perverted. Alcohol will, drinking alcohol will do that to you. And we're going to go into an association that is undeniable in the Bible of perversion mixed with alcohol and as a result of, of people getting drunk and drinking alcohol and, and, what, and what happens as a result. Look at if in uh, Genesis chapter 19. None of the stories of people getting drunk in the Bible are good at all. No positive mention whatsoever. And these two examples that we're going to dig into are both in the book of Genesis. They start off right away, right in the beginning of the Bible, right in Genesis. There's two examples that we're going to read regarding people getting drunk. Okay? There's only a few stories of people actually recorded as getting drunk. Both of these instances also involve rape. Both of them. The first two mentions of people getting drunk in the entire Bible also go hand in hand with rape. 
You might think, oh, well, that's not why I'm getting drunk. Well, it may not be why you're getting drunk. But it happens. It's a reality. It's something I can't. When you get put yourself in that position, when you put yourself in that mind frame, whether you want it to happen or not, it doesn't matter. That's what, I mean, rape is something that you don't want. So rape is something that's forceful against you. And in both of these instances, we're going to see people who got drunk that didn't want to get raped. They didn't want this happening to them, but they were drunk and it happened to them. You put yourself in a position of not being in total control of yourself in, in, a, in a state where it's a lot easier for people to take advantage of you. You do not want to put yourself in that position. Look at And these are not fun stories. But they're here for a reason. Hopefully it'll hit home and you can understand how wicked and how bad this is. And in both of these examples, it's not even just rape. I mean, rape is bad enough on its own as being extremely horrible, wicked sin that you could ever imagine. Both of these are even more perverted than that. They're not even just a man raping a woman, which I don't even want to say just because it's such a horrible crime. That is not a light thing to say, but these are even worse. You're in Genesis chapter 19. This is the story of Lot. If you remember, Lot was the man that, that escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. He was basically like the only righteous person living in Sodom and Gomorrah at that time who God sent angels to go rescue him out of there because he was going to rain fire and brimstone down on the Sodomites. That was God's judgment on that wicked, perverted society was to rain fire and brimstone down from heaven and destroy them all because they had gotten so wicked. But Lot was saved out. He was spared. He was not wicked like them. He was not a Sodomite. He was rescued. He was righteous. He was saved. He was a child of God. God rescued him out, but we're going to see what happens here with his family because it was him and his daughters and his wife. You remember, his wife looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. She died on her way out of, out of Sodom, but here he is now with his daughters, and we're going to read this story in Genesis 19 of what happens because they have had to escape from these cities because God's raining down his judgment. Look at verse number 29 of Genesis 19. It says, And it came to pass... When God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with her father and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ammi, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Here's our, the first reference we're looking at. It's actually the second one in the Bible. We see these two daughters plotting an incestuous relationship with their father by first getting him drunk so that they could take advantage of them in this way. Now you might say, oh, but you know, they're trying to preserve seed. Look, it's wickedness. It's wickedness. That, that is disgusting. This, this, this type of relationship at all. I mean, that's a total lack of understanding. I mean, they saw these nations getting destroyed, so they're living in a cave because these, you know, these other cities are getting destroyed. So they just assume that everybody's destroyed and that they're the only ones left. That's what their mindset is here. But they're thinking, okay, well, we need to do something about this. And they didn't ask their dad about this. They just said, they just can't concocted this plan on their own, saying, well, hey, look, we need to preserve seed. We need to have children by our father. And they get their dad drunk 
And what happens? It says, he didn't know when they lied down. He didn't know when they arose. All as a result of him, of him getting drunk. Now look, if he would have just said, no, we're not going to drink that wine. I'm not going to touch alcohol. None of this would have even happened. And when you, when you realize who these children were, Moab and the children of Ammon, throughout the Bible, th these are wicked nations. These are people that end up getting destroyed. These are people that end up doing some really wicked things that are against God's people. And, um, and all, it all stemmed as a result of this wicked, wicked sin, this incestuous sin, this incestuous re relationship. And that was a rape. He was not wanting to do any of those things. I guarantee you that's why they had to get him drunk. But who was Lot? Lot is someone who said, okay, let's drink some wine. Not only that, the first night he said, the second night, okay, let's drink some more wine. The daughters are bringing wine, let's, let's party, let's, let's have some wine. He didn't even know. They, they laid down, they rose up again. No idea. Because he was drunk, he, he put himself in that position of being vulnerable, of allowing, essentially allowing this wickedness to happen, even though he didn't want it to. When you get drunk, when you start drinking alcohol, hey, look, you're putting yourself in a position to be taken advantage of. Bottom line, I don't care if you're a man or if you're a woman. This happened to a man. This happened to a man getting taken advantage of. Now, it happens more frequently with women getting taken advantage of. I get that. I know that. And that's sad and it's horrible. But just because you're a man, you can't think, oh, well, well I can handle it. That's not going to happen to me. You think he might have felt safe even with his own daughters, and then that's extreme wickedness. Let's turn to our next example. It's even worse. Look at um, chapter 9 of Genesis. This is the first mention of, of someone getting drunk. Genesis chapter 9. This is with Noah. Remember, Noah built the ark. God destroyed the world with a flood. And in Genesis chapter 9, it's after Noah just gets off the ark and God's going to start repopulating the world. And, and you know, Noah was there with his wife and his three sons and their wives. Genesis chapter 9, look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, you might look at this and not quite understand what's going on at first because of the language that's used here. Now, first of all, the Bible is pure. The Bible says that, that every word of God is pure. So, oftentimes you'll see things referred to where there might be a euphemism used. God doesn't get graphic and detailed, especially when it comes to wicked and perverted sins. He'll use other terminology or other words to describe an event that is just ought not to be, to be spoken about in detail. So, for example, an example of this, it says that, that Adam knew his wife Eve and then she was with child, right? So when he says the word he knew her, that's not just saying they were acquainted. Right? It's not just saying like, like, oh, I know Brother Sebastian. You know, like, like, we know each other. I know, I know who he is. That's not what it meant. Obviously, it puts those two together saying, hey, look, no, Adam knew his wife. He knew her intimately in order for her to become with child. That's the type of language that the Bible uses. It's pure. It's holy. It's something that you could read to your children. It doesn't have to get into that detail for us to understand what's going on. So when we see here in this story, when it says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without, look, Noah got drunk, okay, and he was naked in his tent. Now, he's naked, he's passed out, he's in his tent, 
And, it, and it's telling us something here. We saw, saw the nakedness of his father. When you go through the Old Testament, there's a lot of, of um, laws given in um, Leviticus and Deuteronomy where it talks about uncovering the nakedness of somebody. So there's a lot of restrictions that are given out, like, like you're not supposed to marry your daughter-in-law. You're not supposed to marry your aunt or, you know, um, all these different things because you're uncovering, you know, your, your dad's nakedness or your brother's nakedness or things like that, right? Um, by marrying a woman who is already married to your close family member, it's saying you're uncovering their nakedness and, it, and it's referring to that type of a relationship um, um, that a man has with a woman generally uh, of, um, of uncovering their nakedness. And here we see when it says he saw the nakedness of his father, it's not just saying that with his eyes, he just had, he saw his dad naked. It's, it's referring to something a lot worse. And that could be proven. Look at verse number 24. Because if it was just a visual thing, and Noah was passed out, and then his brothers came in and covered him, Noah would have no way of knowing that, that he saw him, right? That, that just with his eyes, he looked upon him as he was laying there naked. But look at what verse number 24 says. Is, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Okay, when you see something, you're not doing something unto somebody. He knew what his younger son had done unto him when he woke up. Because that's not normal. When someone does what, what Ham did unto his father... And you're a man, you're going to know about it. Ham was a sodomite. And he attacked his own father that was drunk and passed out in his tent. And that, you know, he knew what he had done unto him, which is why in verse 25, he goes on these great cursings. There is no way he would curse his son so much if all he had done was just see something with his eyes. There's obviously more to it than that. God is not trying to be graphic with this at all, which is why he refers to it as he saw the nakedness. Okay, this is, this is what the Bible is saying here to keep it in, in language that everybody can hear. But when we read it, we get this understanding on the context. He says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. He said, Canaan is going to serve. Your son's going to serve. You are cursed because of what you had done unto me. It's wickedness. And, and look, the first two examples of people getting drunk, what happens? They get violated. They get attacked. And they get attacked in perverted ways. You cannot ignore the amount of perversion that is, that is in these situations. Because look, there are only so many stories about this in the Bible. There's a couple of them. We just read these two. We're going to turn, if you would, to Habakkuk. That's in the Old Testament. It's in the Minor Prophets, which means it's after the book of Psalms. It's after Proverbs. You got some big books in there. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel are, both real, are all real big books. It's after all of those. It's before the New Testament, of course. You're going to have the book of Habakkuk. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. But see, getting drunk is going to leave you vulnerable. It's going to put you in a state that you ought not to be. Both of these people thought they were safe. Noah was in his tent. He's like, I'm in my house. I'm safe. Uh, this shouldn't be a problem for me. You might think, well, I'm not going out to the bar. You know, and again, I mean, you go out to the bar, good luck. There are a lot of predators out there that are looking just to take advantage of people. They go into these places looking for the people that get drunk, looking for the easy targets, looking for people that they can overpower and do whatever they want with. Because when you're in that state, it's really easy to take advantage of people. You need to take heed for yourself. Look, this is a warning. I would hate for this to happen to anyone in this church or any, anyone that I know or love. Look, there are a lot of bad people out there looking to do bad things and you are opening that door if you decide to go get drunk. And even if you think you're safe at home, hey, what happens when someone wants to break in and you're drunk and passed out in bed? 
How are you going to protect your family, Dad, when you're passed out in your room? Someone decides to break in. You're not going to know when they came in and when they left. Habakkuk chapter 2. People use alcohol to prey on other people. This is, an, again, another known fact. You can look at the crime statistics. It is literally used, you know, like, like a date rape drug. People have been using this all throughout history to get people out of their right mind and to get them to do things that either they normally wouldn't do themselves or that they don't want to do. You know, you, you know people will, will try to influence people to do things that they know they shouldn't do against their better judgment because alcohol is going to lower your reasoning skills. You're not going to be able to make the right decisions. Your eyes are going to be beholding strange women anyways. Your heart will be uttering perverse things. It'll be a lot easier for someone to take advantage of you and do things that you wouldn't normally do when you're in that state, when you're someone that's now all of a sudden your heart's going to be uttering perverse things, you might think, I would never cheat on my wife. I would never cheat on my husband. But then you get into this state, your heart starts thinking some, some wicked things. And then someone else comes to you and really starts just, just honing in on you and, and might end up you know, convincing you to do something you ought not to do that you would never do if you were sober. People's lives, marriages are Ruined. Ruined over what they think is going out and just having a good time with the girls. Just going out and having a good time with the guys. Hey, we're just going to have a few drinks. One thing leads to another and your whole life is in shambles because you, decide, you, you ended up doing something which is really stupid because you were drunk, because you were drinking, because you gave in to the perverted thoughts that were coming up in your mind, in, in your heart. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at verse 15. And, and pay very careful attention to the words that are used here. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Let's read that again, verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. The whole point of them giving him alcohol was to look on their nakedness. But look, do you ever see any mention of a her or a she? It says him, him, his, his neighbor, giving him, it's all male. This is talking about a man giving another man a drink in order to look on his nakedness. That's perverted. That is out there though, my friends. Look, the sodomites, watch out for them. You might think, you know, on TV, they're friendly. They're nice. Oh, they're funny. They're just a little goofy. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's kind of weird that they do that stuff, but whatever. It's not a big deal. They're harmless. No, they are not. Sodomites are predators. We saw that with Noah and his son. We see that here. We saw that in Sodom and Gomorrah when the men came in to stay with Lot and the men of the city came up because they wanted to defile him and abuse him. They wanted to attack him. Look, this is what they're all about. And this is the picture that the Bible paints about them. It's not a pretty picture. God decided to rain fire and brimstone down on Bondo's people because they were so wicked. It is the same thing today. Watch out for them. They are not reproducers. You are not going to be having two homos get together and have children. It doesn't happen like that. They go out and recruit. They go out and get people drunk and then violate them and attack them. Or they go after little kids and they defile them and they get them all screwed up in the head thinking that, that you know, give them all kinds of weird thoughts. There's so many people that grow up that way because they were abused when they were children. Not because they choose that way. Because they get defiled and that's what they know. And they get their whole head screwed up and then, and then proper justice isn't performed. They don't take that pervert and execute him the way they ought to. They just say, oh, you're going to get a slap on the wrist. Oh, you're going to have to register that you're a sex offender. Instead of putting that dirty dog down the way that the Bible says that they ought to. You need to watch out for this, my friends. Again, it's hard for people who are not inherently just, just, just extremely wicked, bad people to understand that there are people like that out there. 
You have a tendency to be a lot more trusting of people and a lot more naive because it's so foreign to you to think that there are actually people out there that want to do harm. That literally their goal is to go out and to, and to get people drunk with the intention of, of violating them. That is their goal. I mean, most people I know, I mean, my friends, people I hung out with, especially when I was going out to the bars, none of us had this thought of saying, we're going to go out and get somebody. We're going to go out and, and we're going to, you know, we're going to get, we're going to get a girl drunk and we're going to take her home. We're, you know, normal people don't think like that. But I'll tell you what, those people exist. Those people are out there. And we see, we see that in all three of these stories here in the Bible. God is warning you. Don't let yourself get in that situation because these people out there, you go out, you think you're just having a good time. Before you know it, your whole life is ruined. Whether it be because somebody attacked you and you got violated or because you had perverted thoughts and you went out and did something you normally wouldn't have done except that you had that alcohol in your system. Look, this is not worth playing around with. The Bible says not to even look on the wine, have nothing to do with it. It adds nothing to your life. It's going to bring misery. It's going to bring woe. It's going to bring sorrow. Don't mess with it. You say, oh, but I'm just having some fun. No. Look, have fun other ways. Play with your children. Go to the park. Exercise. There's so many things you can do that could actually bring you legitimate joy in your life. You don't need a substance to put into your body to make you think you're having a good time. And anyone who's done this knows you're going to have a headache. You're going to be vomiting. It's dirty. It's filthy. It's not good for you. Take heed. Look, I mean, this is, ex this is extreme. You can look at this and be like, man, that's extreme. I never even realized that, that drinking alcohol can be so wicked or could lead to so many wicked things. All three of these stories that we're talking about, people using it to defile people. Don't ignore that. It's a strong warning. Drinking hinders your ability to make good decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, alcohol is a depressant. Drinking may feel good and fun in the short term. It may feel like, hey, I'm having a good time. This is fun. But it's going to end up, in the long run, leaving you feel depressed, leaving you feel defeated in your life. And especially, especially if you're saved, especially if you're a child of God, I believe this is going to have even more of a negative impact on your life, even more than the world. When you know that you're, you're God's... And this, I know this again by experience. I was into alcohol a lot after I was saved. After I knew what I was doing was wrong. And it's not, a, it's not a happy time in my life at all. Years and years of my life wasted and flushed down the toilet, committing wicked acts, doing wicked things, most of the time because it was under the influence of alcohol, so doing even more wicked things, doing even worse stuff that, that I ought not have been doing. And then that empty feeling inside when all the fun's over. When everything's over and, you're, and you wake up with that headache and, and, and you, know, you wake up with that stomach ache and you feel so much worse than when you even went out and got started, it, it's, it's, it's not worth it. And if you're a child of God, on top of that, you're going to have, unless you sear your conscience, you know, you're going to have that Holy Ghost vexing you, letting you know, hey, this isn't right. You shouldn't be doing this. Now, a lot of people might say, well, wait, 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 wait. You know, I, these stories are bad, but, but you know, why does the Bible mention wine so many times? And, I, and you hear this argument all the time. I hear this argument all the time. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. So what do you mean? If, if, you know, if Jesus turned water into wine, then what's wrong with it? Why can't I have a drink? Well, as I mentioned, there is, there are, there is wine. It's not always talking about alcohol. Turn, if you would, please, to Deuteronomy. We're almost done. I'm on my last page here. Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book in the Bible. It's the Old Testament. Deuteronomy number 32. We're going to see two references to wine. One of them is God's wine. The other one is the wine of Sodom. They're two different things. Two different beverages. Deuteronomy 32. 
Deuteronomy chapter number 32. I want everyone to see this. Deuteronomy chapter number 32. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. Chapter 32, verse 13 reads, He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. All positive things, right? I mean, nothing sinful or wrong about, you know, goats and milk and honey, right? All these things are just, just good, normal things. And then it says in the last, in the last uh, phrase of that verse, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Okay. Talk about the pure blood of a grape. When you squeeze a grape, what's going to come out? You're going to get some juice, right? That would be considered the blood of the grape. It's pure. Alcohol is something that, that has to be aged and it's fermented and you start having this extra process going on. That's what it says when the Bible uh, says in Proverbs 23 where we started, when, um, when the wine moveth itself aright and giveth his color, color in the cup, that's when this whole fermentation process is going on. It's talking about that movement and this thing happening. Now it's, it's, it's alcohol, right? But when you just have grape juice, it doesn't start off alcoholic. You have to, it has to go through that fermentation process when it becomes alcohol. This is talking about receive, drinking the pure blood of the grape. This, this is all listed with all good, righteous, wholesome things from God. Jump down to verse number 31. And this is talking about a wicked people saying, for their rock, is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine, again, as, as opposed to our wine, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? He's saying, look, our wine is the pure blood of the grape. This is the good thing that God has given to us. That is our wine. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Their wine is the cruel venom of asp. And asp is a snake, right? It's snake juice. It's snake venom. That is what their wine is like. It's the alcoholic beverage. Again, when it's referring to wine, you can't say, oh, well, in this situation, when it's so completely negative, talking about being the venom of asps, that that's the same wine that Jesus made from water at the banquet. You, that's ridiculous to say that Jesus was serving people with the poison of dragons and the venom of asps, right? They're obviously two beverages, but see, the reason why people don't want to believe that is because they have this notion. Maybe they drink themselves and they say, well, Nope, I want to stick to that. They don't, want to, they don't want to open themselves up to the truth and accept it for what it is. So they like, they like having it out and saying, no, 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 no. You know, wine is wine. I know what wine is. You can't, you can't trick me. Look, the Bible talks about two different drinks. It's clear. And I could go through many other scriptures. I'm not going to tonight. But, but it's very clear from the Bible. My last point that I want to make is... Um, Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. The last point I want to make is that hopefully you could understand to this point, you know, why alcohol is so dangerous, why there's so much, you know, there, there's so much perversion associated with it, so many things. It is so not worth ever messing with, ever getting involved with, uh, especially not getting drunk. I mean, there's so many bad things that could happen to us, and, and you need to be aware of that and watch out for that. But if you say, okay, I get that. I'm not going to drink anymore. I don't, I don't, I'm not, or I don't drink anyways. Well, not only should you, should you not obviously get drunk, don't even hang around with people that are drinking. Don't put yourself in that situation. And again, I could speak from experience on this too. When I decided finally that I was going to quit drinking, I'm done with it. You know what I did? I continued to go out to the bar. I just didn't drink. But I'll go ahead. And I did. I did this. And I, and I, I could attest, I did not drink alcohol. I did not have a drink. But what I'm doing is I'm still putting myself in a situation where everyone else is drinking. Now look, we know that what alcohol does to people, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put bad judgment. 
You know, their eyes are going to, their heart is going to be uttering perverse things. If you're talking to people in the bar, hey, their heart is going to be saying some stupid things. And again, I could attest, being around people who are drunk, you don't realize it if you're drinking as well. But when you just start listening to conversation, the conversation is so stupid. Not only are they stupid, they're filthy. It always turns filthy. Someone will always say something that is completely inappropriate. But no one cares because everyone's drunk because everyone's got their, their judgment clouded and their own hearts are uttering perverse things. But when you're around that atmosphere, when you're sober, you, you pick up on it a little bit more. But it's not, a good, it's not a good environment to be around anyways. When there's bar fights going on, why do you want to put yourself in a position where, where people's um, are going to, where there's contentions, you know, where people are going to get fired up and, and you're going to be in the, at the, in the wrong place at the wrong time? when there's no reason you ever had to be there to begin with. Stay away from those places. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 17, to give you some scripture to back this up, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Stay there. I'm going to close with that verse. But in Proverbs 23, 17, the Bible says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long, for surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So Proverbs is exhorting us, don't be among the wine-bibbers. Don't hang out with them. Don't be there. Hey, they're going to come to poverty. That's what that life is going to lead to. The drunkard's life is going to end up in the gutter. You're going to end up with nothing because, because of that stupid beverage that, you, that when you wait and, you know, um, when, when shall I awake? He says, I will seek it yet again. That you just go right back to it. It does no good for your life. It's only going to bring you sadness. It's only going to bring you woe. But, but yet, for whatever reason, you need to go back to it again. And you get addicted to it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11. I already preached an entire sermon dedicated to this. But um, when I, I preach a sermon called Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company. So don't, don't be friends with, don't be hanging around with. Not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So we're not talking about just people in general. And we're, not, we're also not talking about people who like just got saved and are just learning like, like all this stuff. But if someone's called a brother, if you've been in church for a long time and this is brother so-and-so. You hear people being referred to like that in church. Um, you know, this is brother so and so. They, you know, someone who's established. They know the Bible. They've, you know, they've they've grown and know things. This is what it's referring to. It says, if someone has called a, a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So don't even have a meal with someone like that. If there's someone that's a brother in Christ, someone that, that, is, that is, you know, founded in church, that they're there, they're, they're called a brother, but they're either a fornicator or covetous, and he mentions a drunkard, okay? If they're given to wine, if that's something that they do, they're a drunkard, don't even eat with them. Just don't, don't be among them and, and have no company with them. That's what the Bible's saying to do, and that's why... Um, in this, this list of sins, if someone's coming to this church for a long time and you're considered, you know, a brother or a sister in the sense that, like, you know, you're, you're, you're a faithful member and you've been here for a long time and you fall into one of these categories, then you're going to be kicked out. Now, again, people get saved and there's, there's definitely time and room to grow. Nobody starts off perfect by any means or even ends up perfect okay we know that we're not perfect we know that we're still sinners there, there's there's changes that we need to make in our life and um you know if, if any of this applies to you look um if you haven't been saved for a long time or whatever just start working on it get it out of your life um it's gonna it'll, it'll end up ruining your life it, it's not something and it's definitely not something that offers you anything at all it's going to offer sadness in the end. It's going to sting like an adder. It's going to sting like a snake. You know, it's, it's, it's not good for you at all. Um, 
but you really don't want to put yourself in that situation where where these bad things can happen. So take some heed. These are these are again, I, I these are pretty extreme stories. But these are like the only ones you're going to find in the Bible. God's given you a serious warning. Don't take it lightly. Okay, God, God's looking out for you. God doesn't want you to get involved in this stuff. T take it seriously. There, there is no examples of people getting drunk and everything's just fine. Not in the Bible. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Every time people are getting violated. Now, that may not be the case every single time you go out to the bar, you're not going to get violated. But you're putting yourself, you're, you're opening up the door for that to happen to you. That's why I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for the wisdom. God, these aren't, these aren't the most fun sermons to preach, dear Lord. But it's really heartfelt for me, having gone through a lot of this myself. Lord, um, I hope that, that something that was preached today will sink down. And, and if people don't have this problem already, dear Lord, I pray it will please just reinforce their decisions not to partake in alcohol, not to drink. And if anyone already, you know, if it is a part of life, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just open up their eyes to this and, and, and help them to understand that there really is just, just no good use for alcohol and that it's only going to cause woe and sorrow in their lives, dear Lord. And we thank you so much for giving us this wisdom, for giving us these stories. God, hopefully they're eye-opening. To, to help us just understand how wicked this really can get. And um, I, I know that nobody in this room wants any of these types of things that we read in these stories to happen to us. And um, help us to be wise, dear Lord, and to receive the wisdom from your word that, that we would never put ourselves into this situation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.